So I'm starting in 1957. This is a picture taken at the Virginia Monument, May of 1957 to be precise. Uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, Monty, as we all know him, was taking a, uh, uh, a brief tour of the United States and obviously stopping in Gettysburg to see his old uh, colleague Eisenhower. I won't call him his old friend, but we'll call him, a, call him his old colleague uh, kind of thing. Shortly before arriving in Gettysburg, uh, Monty had created a little bit of a stir in the, uh, in the American press. Uh, during an interview, he had basically said to the effect that he would have, um, he would have fired both Robert, sacked was the term that he used. He would have sacked both Robert E. Lee and George Meade following the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, and you know, so the American press picked up on this a little bit. And of course, they wanted to know, Ike, what do you think of all this? Yeah. <laughs> Ike, in his usual professional courtesy diplomacy, which he was, which he was kind of known for, um, somewhat agreed with Monty, and I, I emphasize the word somewhat because I'll kind of come back to this at the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, but at the same time, you know, Ike kind of said to the press guys, no, 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 don't, 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 get, don't get me involved in this. <laughs> But what they did do, and what they're doing here in the image, is they are standing at the iconic Virginia State Memorial on the Gettysburg Battlefield. Actually standing on the platform, which, you know, technically you're not supposed to do. But I guess when you're Ike, you know, you kind of can, can, can get away with it, right? And here's Monty. Here's Monty kind of telling the press what a bad idea Pickett's charge was. And that, and that Lee should have given him, given him a right hook instead, so to speak. Which, of course, many of us who know the Battle of Gettysburg know that on July 2nd, that was kind of what Lee had tried. But anyways, they're standing here, they're pondering the battlefield, and they're kind of pondering Pickett's charge. That great, disastrous July 3rd assault that Robert E. Lee had launched, more or less from this point. And this is the view, right? I mean, this is a modern view, but at least from 1957 to, um, to today, that modern view hasn't changed a whole heck of a lot. And you might have assumed that the view and the usage of that battlefield had not changed from 1863 onward. Uh, and we're gonna talk today that that basically is, is not true. So what I'm gonna do today with my presentation, mostly focus on the battlefield, uh, but in general, kind of talk just about some of the various connections between this infamous July 3rd assault Pickett's Charge, so some of the connections between Pickett's Charge and World War I, World War II, and as I said before, kind of take it up in through the uh, 1940s, 1950s. There's a lot going on, a lot to unpack, as we like to say on the podcast. We're going to talk about Ike, we're going to talk about infantry training, tank training, POW camps, and all of that stuff. So let's kind of get into it. As I said, I can't assume everybody in the audience is a Civil War student. I know many of you are. Um, we're not doing a deep dive on Pickett's Charge today. Uh, but for anybody, just kind of a quick recap and how it ties into the presentation, right? July 3rd, 1863, third day of the Battle of Gettysburg. Robert E. Lee, James Longstreet, assemble an infantry assault of about 12,000 or so 500 Confederate infantrymen supported by over 100 pieces of field artillery, basically uh, cross what would be a mile of open ground to hit the center of the Union defenses on Cemetery Ridge. Old joke, why are battles always fought in national parks? <laughs> and that, that joke never fails to get a laugh, right? no, matter, no matter how many times you trot that one out. Well, of course, in 1863, this was not national park. And as we'll see up into the early 1900s, it wasn't National Park either. And that's kind of part of the, the theme of today. This was farmland owned by people named Bliss and Spangler and Kadori and Brian uh, and things of that nature. And this was the land that he used. And we're going to kind of focus really today on a lot of sort of this part of the battlefield and how it was used militarily into the, uh, into the 20th century. But before we go there... There's an obvious connection to Pickett's Charge in World War II that I feel like I would be remiss if, if I didn't talk about today. Meet Colonel Waller Taswell Patton. Now, Patton, at the Battle of Gettysburg, served in Pickett's Division. Uh, he was part of the 7th Virginia and James Kemper's Brigade. Colonel Patton was only 27 years old 
at the Battle of Gettysburg. And the Patton family came from a uh, storied ancestry of, of, of military heroes. Great grandfather was the Revolutionary War hero, General Hugh Mercer. Colonel Patton's brother, Colonel George Patton. Uh, served in the 22nd Virginia, which was part of the uh, uh, Confederate Regiment, but not here at the, um, at the Battle of Gettysburg. Colonel Patton was a VMI graduate, and actually on July 3rd at Gettysburg, two of his classmates and good friends were also crossing that field in Pickett's division with him. Uh, you know, Patton was pretty somber that day. He had had a chance to examine the Union positions and knew the, um, um, knew the difficulty that was, that was in store for this man. So Patton stepped off with his regiment, participated in Pickett's charge, and when they reached, roughly when his regiment reached the Emmitsburg Road, Colonel Patton was seriously, grievously wounded through the jaw, took a shot through the jaw, uh, which basically, basically knocked out you know, the lower part of his mouth. So very seriously wounded. So Colonel Patton was left behind when the Army of Northern Virginia retreated. He was deemed to be too, um, too injured to travel, and he was treated at the uh, Pennsylvania College Field Hospital. Because of the injury, he couldn't speak. And so what Colonel Patton would do is he would uh, basically communicate with his, his nurses, his captors, uh, through writing them notes. He wrote some notes home to his mother to let his mother know how he was doing that sort of thing. Would also write on, I guess, a little bit of a chalkboard kind of thing. And um, originally he told his family that he was going to recover and it was not serious, but unfortunately he took a turn for the worse and he died at the hospital on July 21st only a few days after his 28th birthday. Shortly before he died, he wrote a note, said, tell my mother that I am about to die in a foreign land. And his captors were astonished that this Virginian considered Pennsylvania to be a foreign land, which is, of course, you know, symbolizes so much about the, uh, about the uh, Civil War. But you guys have probably figured out the connection, Patton, at this point. Uh, when Colonel Patton eventually was uh, interred in the uh, cemetery in Winchester, Virginia, next to his brother, Colonel Patton, who I mentioned on the previous slide, Colonel Patton was killed in action in 1864. And here's an image in 1919 of their, um, uh, of their ancestor, George Patton. So Colonel Patton was, the Waller Patton, the guy that I talked about, was the great uncle of future General George Patton, and Waller's brother George was General Patton's grandfather. So that's kind of your first connection today. And this is, as I said, this is an image of um, uh, future General Patton, 1919, I believe that's his father, at the grave in Winchester, in, in, as I said, in 1919. Now George Patton, General Patton, was proud of his military ancestry. He was proud of his, his, his Confederate connection, and it was said that he would often use um, you know, his, his, his lineage, his connections to sort of spur himself to greater heights and greater feats of bravery on battlefields. So even though Patton himself had been born in California, he was proud of his Confederate ancestry and it was something that stayed with him throughout, um, throughout his life and his career. So that's kind of our first, first connection today. Now Colonel Patton Waller was ultimately one of about seven to 8,000 combined casualties on both sides, talking Union and Confederate, uh, who either were killed, wounded, captured during the July 3rd assault. This is an image of the, uh, what probably many of us know is the Elliott burial map. And uh, the burial map, which is plotted in 64, tried to basically mark the positions of uh, mass graves on the battlefield. The men fell. For the most part, they were buried in these mass graves. Elliott and company came around later and tried to basically plot the positions of these mass graves. Although we don't necessarily think the numbers are accurate today, uh, I, I, I do use the Elliott map as a reference for the concentrations of the dead. And you can see again, some of this ground that we're gonna be talking about today, the fields of Pickett's Charge, the Emmitsburg Road Corridor, you can see the huge numbers of dead and casualties that were interred on that battlefield. One might assume therefore, with all of these casualties on this field, that this would have immediately remained hallowed ground and wouldn't be put to use 
any other use, uh, commercial use, military use, or anything of that nature. You might assume that, but you would be wrong. So as we fade to black a little bit and kind of um, leave the Civil War era, the armies departed Gettysburg. Civil War, of course, continued for about another 18 months or so. Those dead that I referenced on the last slide uh, were eventually, for the most part, reinterred through the 1870s. Gettysburg then began their immediate love-hate relationship with a tourism-based economy. I just felt like I had to kind of throw that in because it started immediately. And as part of that, portions of the battlefield were threatened with commercial development. Um, you know, and you might kind of wonder at that point, greatest battle of the Civil War, three days in July 1863, that would seem to be enough military history for any one small town, uh, had Gettysburg's military history ended. Well, leave it to one man to come to the rescue. <laughs> Okay, so the Civil War people in the audience know, you know the punchline here. If you don't know who, if you don't know who this is, uh, this is former Union General Dan Sickles. And yes, podcast listeners were asking if we would do a Dan Sickles report today. This is the first, I don't believe the only, but the first Dan Sickles report that we're covering today. Look, if you don't know Sickles, it's a crazy story. Congressman in the 1850s, he had murdered his wife's boyfriend. Battle of Gettysburg, he, he misinterprets George Meade's orders on the second day of the battle, puts the whole Union left flank at risk. It's a crazy, charming, heartwarming story. <laughs> But the point we're covering today is the role that he plays as a congressman in the 1890s in establishing what we know today as Gettysburg National Military Park. So while he was a congressman in the 1890s, as I said, the battlefield is under various threats and the country as a whole is making movements to create these new national military parks. Uh, congressman Dan Sickles introduced the legislation that created what we know today as Gettysburg National military park. Now as part of that, and I've been a tour guide here at Gettysburg for 20 years, when you tell people about this era, and it's not very often, for the most part people come here to talk about the Civil War, but when you tell people about this era and some of the things that are going on in the battlefield in World War I and World War II, people are often aghast. How did the National Park Service let this happen? You know, this modern, this modern view we have of battlefield preservation, you know, that they would have kept the field pristine and only, you know, only in its Civil War condition. Um, it didn't exist back then. And part of that was because, and I don't know how well you guys can read this in the room, but part of that was because the original Sickles bill turned the battlefield over to the Secretary of War, the War Department. And so during the early days of Gettysburg National Military Park, it was run and operated not by a National Park Service, but by the War Department. Now having said that, people always say, oh, that explains it. Well, the War Department's job was to use the battlefield for training and education and that sort of thing. Not so fast, because the Sickles Bill specifically told the War Department, you're gonna protect this battlefield. You're going to open up roads. You're going to mark the lines of battle. You're going to protect monuments. You're going to provide easy access to the battlefield for visitors, preservation, care, all that stuff. So, um, you know, look, obviously, pro-military. I don't think, though, if you want to protect and preserve a national park, turning it over to the Army is going to be the best <laughs> steward. I'm just thinking that might not work out so well from, from, that, from that perspective. But that was the mission, even though it was the War Department, that was still the mission to protect and preserve the battlefield. So how did that go? Yeah, not very well, right? So we, um, and you know, obviously other things interfere. World War I, for example. So, you know, within a decade and a half or so of the park being established, obviously the United States' formal entry into World War I is going to be one of the first things that's, that's going to kind of change, change the, um, the mission here, so to speak. And um, what you have to realize is, you know, when the Army 
when the country starts to get into World War I, there simply was not an infrastructure in place in the United States for the rapid mobilization that was needed. Uh, ultimately, the Army was going to grow from about 200,000 to about 3 million. You didn't have the training, you didn't have the facilities in the United States to, to basically muscle up this Army. So what are you going to do? Somebody gets the bright idea, let's, let's convert the national military parks into use. So the first use really comes into play uh, with infantry training. So the infantry starts to arrive here, um, you know, again, pretty early in the, uh, in the summer of 1917. Again, I hope you guys can see it with the lighting in the room. Uh, this is an image of infantry kind of practicing on some of the grounds that Pickett's men and other soldiers would have charged across during the Battle of Gettysburg. And we can, you know, we can cite this pretty easily today because there's a couple monuments in the background. You can see for Massachusetts, 26th PA over here. You can see the Rogers House site over there. So you can go to that today and, and pretty much figure out, figure out where this site, where this picture was taken. And so the infantry comes in, and as I said, summer of 1917, um, they start to basically mobilize. And what's kind of ironic is there's another thing going on while the Army is arriving here, June of 1917, and that's the dedication of the Virginia State Memorial, which is, you know, probably, well, I would say probably, it is the most iconic Confederate memorial on the Gettysburg battlefield and certainly the most iconic symbol of Pickett's charge as we know it, you know, because it more or less sits where Pickett's division stepped off and where Lee allegedly watched much of the grand assault. So, but I find some irony in the fact that you have this iconic Confederate monument being dedicated here literally while the army is on the other side of the field building this infantry training camp. And um, as Confederate veterans attended this dedication ceremony, uh, one of the newspaper accounts talked about it. They literally say, quote, as the rebel veterans looked out from Seminary Ridge, where the memorial had been sighted, they saw a sea of modern day soldiers working feverishly to build a camp on the same field that some of them had crossed during Pickett's charge. So you can kind of, you know, a little bit of irony there, and you can kind of, kind, of, kind of imagine and kind of wonder what the two sides were thinking as they were looking across the um, field at each other. But by late, late 1917, the infantry, the infantry mobilization's kind of underway. The infantry's starting to, um, uh, to kind of go on. And uh, for a little bit, Gettysburg, falls quiet until you get into the spring of 1918. And then when you get into the spring of 1918, they realize or they decide that they're going to use the park for tank training because we really don't have any tank training infrastructure in the United States as well. And so this introduces us to Captain Dwight Eisenhower, who uh, assumed command of what would become known as Camp Cold uh, in late March, early April of 1918. Now Ike had been to Gettysburg previously. He'd been here on a uh, class field trip with West Point in 1915. Uh, you can see there are images of that trip here. So this was, uh, this was not Ike's first foray at Gettysburg. And so he arrived with his young wife, uh, Mamie, and um, you know, their, their son, David Icky Eisenhower, who of course would unfortunately die of scarlet fever a few years later. But Icky, I believe, celebrated his first birthday here in Gettysburg, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And so Ike and Mamie, were, they were happy to be together as a family, but Ike was not happy to be getting a stateside assignment. You know, he was a soldier. He wanted to be on a battlefield. He wanted, you know, with his classmates and his peers, he wanted to be overseas in Europe. But as Ike wrote in, in one of his books, he said something to the effect of, well, you know, I, you know, I didn't want to be here, but I had to learn one of the primary missions of being a soldier is to accept my orders. And my orders would be here. And he, um, and, you know, he, and he obviously did a great job with Camp Cold, especially because he got assigned to command a tank training school that didn't have any tanks. 
Right? The United States wasn't manufacturing tanks. They didn't have any tanks to train these guys on. And so initially, with the ingenuity of um, a couple of enlisted men, I think from the Brooklyn area, if we have any Brooklyn Brooklynites in the audience, um, they started to train initially with car and truck parts. Even, even kind of doubling one of them, the Battling Lizzie. Uh, now, this is not a picture of Ike at Gettysburg. I think this picture is taken um, shortly afterwards, but I used it because of the tank in the background to, to kind of give you a good idea. So initially, we're training here without tanks. So as far as battlefield usage, Camp Colt was massive, right? And so I'll highlight. There we go. Just kind of show you a few things here that I've highlighted. So again, Emmitsburg Road, high water mark, the famed 8th Ohio up here to kind of give you an idea where the left flank was and Camp Cold headquarters was, was up in that area as well. Uh, this area here would be about, the Abra about where the Abraham Bryan farm was. Um, again, just to kind of cite you to some modern landmarks at its peak, at its peak, Camp Colt was about 10,600 men. And again, look, I'm glad we won World War I. Uh, I'm, not saying, you know, I'm not saying that this shouldn't have happened, but Mark Snell in his book on this era calls Camp Colt an ecological disaster for the Gettysburg battlefield. And, and, and I think I would agree with him on that because you know, literally if this is the high watermark area and think of that, pristine open field I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Look at all the structures, tents and you know permanent structures, literally going all the way up to the high water mark and stretching all the way down in this direction. Check out the water, the sewage treatment plant down here. I mean, a sewage treatment plant on the battlefield and continuing up in this direction. Um, just, you know, obviously a huge infrastructure ultimately gets put, put in play. And again, this is just kind of a highlight again to kind of show it to you up, up close. So again, there's your high water mark. And you can just see literally how it consumed all of this ground of Pickett's Charge that, you know, that I was talking about at the beginning of this. The famous swimming pool is, is down here somewhere. Um, so again, today we would be aghast. A sewage treatment plant on the battlefield? You gotta be kidding me. Um, and what it did to the water supply and the, and the fields and, 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 and all of that stuff. And again, here's a view from, taken from the Pennsylvania State Memorial looking out across the field so you can get an idea again how much ground Camp Cold consumed, the, the railroad cutting through it. You can see there, there's our ubiquitous Virginia Memorial, which I'm referring to a few times in the presentation. So you can get Kadori Farm is over here. So this, this image in part, in part gives you an idea of the size and the scale of the, of the camp, but you know, can barely, barely touch upon it as you can see went all the way down and, and up in this direction in a town about where General Pickett's Buffet is today. So about where General Pickett's Buffet is, is where Camp Cold headquarters was. So, you know, now that we're shutting down General Pickett to quote unquote, preserve the battlefield, um, it's it kind of already, already, and I'm gonna miss General Pickett, but that's just me. Okay, so eventually you gotta get these tanks. So the tanks do arrive. Tanks come, I think, um, I think in about June, June or so, and as Ike wrote in one of, his, uh, one of his accounts, quote, the tank corps was new. There were no precedents in terms of basic training, and I was the only regular officer in the command. Now I began to learn about responsibility. Although we were part of the tank corps, we only knew about tanks from hearsay in newspapers. <laughs> so, you know, they got to kind of get to uh, get to work here. And so, Ike says three tanks arrived. I've seen other historians kind of question that number. I think the important thing today, there ain't many tanks. I think that's the important thing we want to do. Now again, don't bust my chops. I'm not a World War I hardware guy, uh, but this was the FT-17 Renault. I wanted to make sure I did my French pronunciation of that, uh, which is what a two-manner, I think, with, with one machine gun sort of thing. But here's an example of them. This picture is taken 
on the Gettysburg battlefield. And you can see initially how they're kind of using this with the tank out in front and the infantry support immediately behind you. You take infantry across the battlefield, which we saw on the other slide. Where are you going to drive your tanks? You're going to drive your tanks on the battlefield. Let's take them over to the Bliss Farm, you know, and, and kind of ride them over remnants of the Bliss Farm and that sort of thing. And by the way, watch out for the monuments, <laughs> you know, that are right next to you kind of thing. Remember that? Remember that mission to preserve and protect the monuments? But this is kind of a cool image. And again, I do a lot of Pickett's Charge Tours. I walk this part of the field a lot, as many of you know the embankment of the Bliss Farm is still there, so you can easily kind of, and these monuments obviously are still there, you can go out today and easily kind of cite this to, uh, to where this occurred. But this is what they're doing, so they're, they're riding this small number of tanks up and down the battlefield and obviously doing their training. Here's an image too, kind of up and around the Emmitsburg Road area. And again, you can see I've cited the Pennsylvania State Memorial here in the, um, in the background. Now, my, my goal here today isn't to do a comprehensive history of Camp Cold. Um, probably the biggest challenge Eisenhower faced during his period in command of it was the, uh, the influenza epidemic you know, which struck in, in September of 1918. Ultimately, there were about 150 deaths in the camp because of that, and that was probably his biggest command crisis during the time that he was here. But by the, um, by the fall of 1918, Ike was reassigned in November, and, and he finally, finally got that overseas assignment that he was waiting for. And they were gonna go overseas, and the armistice was signed. So he didn't, he didn't get that overseas assignment. And so he ended up, you know, he ended up going, uh, I think his next assignment was, I think he went down to, to Fort Meade, if I'm not mistaken. But um, ultimately, Ike went on. Camp Cold faded into history. Um, it was originally closed in March of 1919. And do you think the Army was good partners in cleaning up the battlefield afterwards? <laughs> I'm thinking probably not. Well, I know probably not. I'm teasing you a little bit. And so there was a big mess left behind. So you've got this. And again, here's kind of these two images. I'll try to go back. These two images kind of run together. You kind of go this way. And then here you go. Now you get a view going down the Emmitsburg Road. One of the things they did was they seriously damaged the Emmitsburg Road with all the heavy equipment that had been going up and down it for a few years. Uh, Ike at one point had promised to work with the Park Commission to, um, to rebuild all of this, but that never really happened. And so the park was stuck with about $7,400 in damage just to the uh, Emmitsburg Road, uh, which in modern money is about $146,000. So they left them a little bit of a bill for the Park Commission to, uh, to kind of clean it up. The other thing which I had never realized until I read it in, in Mark Snell's book, I'd never really realized one of the things the Army had done during the Camp Cold era was uh, they sprayed tar on the battlefield to keep the dust down. So then when they left, you basically had kind of this ugly black stain all over the, uh, all over the battlefield. So, you know, again, another thing that kind of got messed up. And I don't even know what happened to the sewage treatment plant. Hopefully, you know, you know, just think of that the next time you think you're gonna take a sip out of Plum Run or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> All right, so we've got the biggest battle of the Civil War. We've got infantry training. We've got tank training. You've got a young Dwight Eisenhower here. Surely that would be enough for any one small town, right? Not quite. So uh, a few more years go by. Now we're up to 1922, and the Marines decide they're going to use Gettysburg for a reenactment. That's kind of a cool photo. And again, I don't know how, uh, how well you guys can read this in the room, but we've got Pershing, President Warren Harding, General Lejeune. Okay, if you're, if you're like me and you get these emails asking if I've ever served at Camp Lejeune, <laughs> I may be entitled to generous compensation. If you've never seen an image of him, that's what he looked like. And Brigadier General Smedley Butler, who was really the commander of the Marine reenactment here, um, at the time one of the most decorated, well, one of the most decorated Marines in all of history. But the idea was, it's 1922, we're post-World War I, uh, there's, you know, what, do we, what does the American government always do, right? You mobilize up for war, then after the war, you start talking about, okay, how can we save money and mobilize down? And there was talk 
There was talk basically about scaling down or even eliminating the Marine Corps. So between Lejeune and Butler, who liked to march their guys around anyways, they would take their, the Marines around really as kind of a publicity stunt to kind of show people, look, this is what the Marines can do. And I think it was Butler, one of them gets the great idea that we should, um, let's go to Gettysburg. And so what is that about Sickles? Uh, well, pretend I didn't hear that, Carolyn. <laughs> Go to Gettysburg, let's go to Gettysburg and let's train on the Gettysburg battlefield. We'll attract media, we'll attract the press and, um, and all of that stuff. So, so they, come, they come in uh, July of 1922, um, about I think about 5,500 or so are here with men are here with the command. And so what they do is they basically replay, reenact Pickett's Charge twice. Once they do it kind of with, uh, you know, Civil War era weaponry, whatever they would have had on hand. And then they kind of do it again with modern weaponry and that sort of thing to kind of show the difference. But here's a shot of them hunkered down at the, um, at the high water mark area. This is kind of the angle. And you can see them kind of hunkered down. If you look at the image real close, you can see a couple guys just kind of lounging on their back, you know, kind of kind of relaxing a little bit, which reminds me of a lot of Civil War reenactments <laughs> that, I've, that I've seen over the years and that sort of thing. Um, now, probably many of you know the story. There was there were two fatalities at the reenactment. Uh, June 26, a little bit before the Marines actually arrived, uh, there was a biplane accident. Captain George Hamilton and a member of his crew, they were coming in and they crashed, their plane crashed, basically around where Steinway Avenue is today, kind of behind the Gettysburg Heritage Center in that general area. And Captain Hamilton and, and his gunner were, um, were both killed, which are basically considered to be, as of now, the last military fatalities at Gettysburg because of that. But you know, besides that, it went off well. President Warren G. Harding, uh, and this is only about a year before Harding's death, so we can kind of wonder, you know, what kind of health he might have been in. Harding and Mrs. Harding came, they watched it, they climbed the observation tower at Ziegler's Grove uh, to basically watch this. And we set up a temporary White House for them on the battlefield. Uh, canvas and wood, the structure contained 16 connected rooms. 16, 16. yes. <laughs> Well, you're the president. You need 16 rooms, <laughs> as well as a telephone and radio hookup to communicate with Washington and the rest of the camp, sort of thing. So uh, Harding, Harding, by most accounts, seemed to have uh, to enjoyed himself immensely. I like I like this image because again, you know, it's kind of it's it's military guys going across Pickett's Charge, and you know we don't have any photographic image of what it looked like during the Civil War. So I kind of feel like maybe this is this is kind of the next the next best thing. But I love I love this image of you know the soldier, the Marines in particular, kind of kind of charging across the field there. And about fifty thousand people watched the reenactment, including a couple Civil War veterans. So one of the guys in attendance was uh, um, Superintendent Emmer Cope who had served with George Meade during the Battle of Gettysburg. And a newspaper has him enthusiastically watching the Marines, you know, the Marines pretending to be Confederates retreat. And the newspaper quotes Cope as saying, get back there, you know, as the Confederates are kind of <laughs> kind of going back. So you've got, you've got Civil War guys watching this reenactment. You've got World War I era guys um, um, participating in the reenactment as well. Among the other observers was uh, Teddy Roosevelt Jr., who of course would land at D-Day and died about a, a month or so later um, after that. But so you literally hear at this reenactment, for my intents and purposes today, you literally got kind of all three of these generations kind of, uh, kind of coming together and watch this. And, and um, you know, I think, I think that's kind of cool. Okay. Another 20 years go by. The world is at war again. The country is at war again. You might think that was the end of Gettysburg's usage. 1944, um, we don't do infantry or tank training this time, but what we decide we're gonna do this time is we're gonna put a POW camp on the field. And so initially, 
Initially, the camp uh, is a tent, basically a tent camp. So here's an image from the uh, Gettysburg National Military Park archives, Emmitsburg Road, um, and you can basically see kind of the dimensions of the camp. You've got some tents here, some, some buildings, barbed wire kind of, uh, kind of surrounding it. So the idea was it was basically in play in the summer of 1944, at least in warm weather. They would, they would move them later when, when the weather got colder. But at its peak, we had about 500 German POWs. Uh, many of them, I think, had served under Rommel, and some have been captured in North Africa. I'll talk a little bit about that later. About 90 guards, you know, as I said, kind of a barbed wire uh, enclosure. And one of the things about it, too, is you've got this on what is still a very public road. And so one of the challenges that the, that the uh, commanders of the POW camp had was they had to restrict access to the camp. So remember what I said at the beginning, you know, we're supposed to improve access to the battlefield. Oh, yeah. I mean, I get it. I get defeating the Nazis was important. I get it, you know, but, but again, kind of, kind of going against the mission, the mission of all of this. Uh, and the other thing too, um, the pro one of the problems they had was the people of the town wanted to talk to the Germans. They wanted to talk to them and, you know, probably, probably learn and, and kind of about all that sort of thing. And so one of the biggest challenges they had running the camp was keeping the locals and the Germans away from each other. Now the Germans, the prisoners, the POWs, uh, they did leave the camp because they would go work on the fruit farms and the plant, the apple plants up in Aspers and, and that sort of thing. They'd be paid, I forget what the number was, something like a dollar a week or something like that. And most of that would go back into their government account. I, f I forget what the number was, but um, you know, not paid a lot, but they were paid. And here's an image of it. So again, are one of our common threads here today. I've circled the Virginia Monument, so you can kind of see the promin prominent landmark. The camera here is kind of behind, you know, the Union defenses up around Cemetery Ridge. Here's the Emmitsburg Road, kind of running like that, and here's our little tent city, German POWs, summer 1944. All right, so you're thinking, well, it's cool, must not probably, you think, Jim, there probably wasn't much action, right? I mean, we're wrong. Okay, so July of 1944, July 5th to be exact, two, two prisoners escape. What did some of them had done, there was kind of a tunnel, a drainage kind of running under the Emmitsburg Road that kind of came out where the high watermark area oh, was. Go? Well, I don't know, but you escaped. <laughs> so they escaped. They go to some of the farms. They may, them to a ship. Maybe, try, maybe try to hide out at some of the farms and, you know, some of that. But, but you, you, you're with me here. They didn't get away with that. They didn't get away with that. Do you know the end of the story? Because they don't get away with that. They don't, yeah, they don't, get, they don't get away. They don't get very far. But they do, they do try. They do try, right? All right two, two Germans walking around Adams County in 1944. Who'd be suspicious, right? Um, yeah, right, right. So they, they round the lamb for eight days. And it's neat, too, to read some of the newspaper accounts from it because the, uh, the, commander, the commander of the camp is kind of trying to downplay it. Oh, there's been reports of an escape here. No, no, we've, we've got everything under control. But, uh, but again, eight days later, they were recaptured. November, November of 44, November of 44, one of the, uh, one of the POWs commits suicide, hangs himself at one of the, uh, one of the plants in Aspers. Now, by November of 44, they've also, again, they moved now to some of the structures in McMillan's Wood, Camp Sharp, and that sort of thing, kind of bringing an end to the, uh, to the little tent encampment here. Uh, but September, you know, still kind of considered active, and a camp guard was found dead uh, with a bullet in the head. And I don't believe, I could be wrong, I don't believe they ever, they ever really learned more about that or, or what that was about. So you could argue that he, too, was kind of the last military casualty here as well. So um, a couple of thoughts here. You know, I mentioned on the um, I mentioned on the prior slide that again one of the, the great things they had difficulty with was uh, keeping the the uh, prisoners away from the um, from the residents. And this is a quote from one of the newspapers. Uh, quote: The guards are present not only to prevent the prisoners from escaping, but to protect the prisoners themselves. Under the terms of the Geneva Convention um, regarding war prisoners, no one may talk to the prisoners or question them. The guards are instructed to prevent such attempts. And so again, because of that, they had to restrict access to the camp 
because of that. Time has a habit of softening things, doesn't it? You know, I was a German POW, but oh, I, it was the best part of my life kind of thing. Um, one of the men came back to Gettysburg in July of 2001, and I remember this. My wife and I lived here at the time, and I, I remember this, and this was covered in the uh, Gettysburg Times. This guy's name is Carl Brantz, and he came back here, and he had served under Rommel in North Africa, um, and he was quoted in the July 16, 2001 Gettysburg Times. I had an experience in what I learned in life. I had an experience in what I learned in life was during this time. I would not give back not one little thing. I learned a lot. The odd years later, he was able to kind of kind of view his captivity here in in Adams County in a in a more positive positive light. And so I'm I'm thinking over the years others have have come back, but that one I remember uh, because we had we'd kind of lived here. So obviously now World War II ends, but we have this one last connection. There we go. Hold on. Eisenhower comes back, 1950, he comes back. And one of the neat things about this, and this is him at the high water mark, no, wait, this is Ike at high water mark with noted Civil War historian Bruce Catton. And, you know, Eisenhower, obviously with his own interest in military history, uh, became a uh, bit of a Gettysburg tour guide in his own right. He would take VIPs around. You're going to hear about another one in the, um, um, in the next presentation. But uh, he became very enthusiastic about the Civil War. He writes in one of his bro books, you know, I literally have bought a farm right next to where Pickett's men stepped off for Pickett's charge. Maybe not right next to, but, you know, you know kind of close enough sort of thing. And there's a neat quote here um, in, in one of David Eisenhower's books where he talks about this. And I'm gonna kinda, I'm gonna kinda take you through this. This is David Eisenhower writing about Ike. Quote, Granddad spoke about the Battle of Gettysburg is a real expert. One of Granddad's most memorable dinner subjects was General George Meade. For almost 100 years, historians had fixed in legend the idea that Meade had forfeited an opportunity to end the Civil War in 1863 by failing to pursue Lee's defeated forces after Gettysburg. It was interesting to me that Granddad often offered facts about Meade to his way of thinking explained, if not vindicated, the general's caution in the aftermath of this significant Union victory. So you see Ike around the dinner table with the family championing George Meade. You know, and this is, again, this is, this is the 1950s, the 1960s. We've talked about on the podcast this great mead renaissance that's going on today where everybody's viewing mead favorably. Obviously, in the 1950s and 1960s, that wasn't the case among historians. And, you know, in a lot of ways, Ike was kind, really kind of ahead of the curve on that. But, but David Eisenhower added something else that I think is interesting. In hindsight... In these evening seminars about the Civil War, Granddad was reviewing his own wartime service. In the summer of 44, Dwight Eisenhower, like Meade, had been accused of failing to exploit the victory in Normandy in ways that might have ended the, the war that year. Okay, so now you see Ike kind of seeing some parallels between he and Meade, you know? Meade has won the great victory at Gettysburg, yet he was criticized for not following up and not finishing the war fast enough. And Ike was kind of using that to draw parallels to himself and his own experiences with that. And I think that's kind of interesting. And by the way, too, Ike also offered an opinion on Dan Sickles, <laughs> which was not as favorable. And I want to thank Jared. Jared, a year or three ago, I don't remember, Jared sent me a newspaper article one day. said, hey, did you ever see Ike talk about Sickles? And I'm like, I don't think so. And here's the, here's the quote. So I want to thank Jared for this. Ike on Sickles, quote, a very terrible person as an individual. But he was a fighter. But he disobeyed orders. And to that extent, he was reprehensible. <laughs> All right. I should go into the voice of some of my colleagues, Sickles was reprehensible kind of thing. But if you, ever, if you ever wanted to know what Ike thought about Sickles, there it is, reprehensible. Which, my friends, brings us full circle back to the beginning of the presentation. 
And so, again, Ike is using this, these years that he's here to bring VIPs, friends, colleagues around the battlefield. We talked about at the beginning, talked about at the beginning that um, Monty is on this 1957 visit. And one of the things Monty's done is he's created a little bit of a stir uh, for s suggesting that both Lee and Meade should have been sacked. Uh, you might kind of wonder, Meade won the Battle of Gettysburg. What would you sack him for? And I believe the phrase Monty used was for, quote, unquote, not having control of the situation. I mean, whatever the hell that means <laughs> kind of thing. And, you know, obviously we all know what Monty thought of American military, you know, the American military. Anyway, so I'm sure he was, he was trying to get every, every jab in uh, that he possibly could. So I told you initially, initially I think Ike, maybe out of professional courtesy, that famed diplomacy that he was kind of known for, maybe, maybe kind of sort of agreed, although he really kind of said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't get me into this and that sort of thing. But I think what we've learned today from the previous slide and from what I'm about to tell you, uh, you know, Ike was a great um, enthusiast. He was a great supporter of both Meade and Lee. And after Monty left a couple of days later, Ike quickly reminded newsmen that among the four portraits of the, quote, greatest Americans hanging in his office was a portrait of Robert E. Lee. And this is Ike talking, quote, anybody who tries to put him in any other position is mistaken. All right. At 1957, an American president publicly supporting Robert E. Lee. Obviously, in 2023, you couldn't do that, right? They would all run for cover. And it goes back to a, a piece of David Eisenhower's quotes, quote that I didn't mention, but it goes back to that. Again, he found it interesting that Ike was drawing parallels between the Civil War and World War II. Uh, but at that time, in the 1950s, unlike the Second World War, the Civil War was a safe topic. So I felt like, you know, it was too close in time to World War II. You couldn't, you couldn't talk about it, but the Civil War was a safe topic. Boy, hasn't the worm turned on that, yeah. right? Civil War is anything but a safe topic today. As I said, a sitting president coming out in support of Robert E. Lee, you know, would, would never happen today, but, but that's how it was viewed then. So, okay, let me kind of conclude with one thing. So, as I said at the opening, I'm kind of like the bridge today. I'm covering all the eras, Civil War, all the way up to World War II and beyond. Some of you may not be Civil War enthusiasts. I hope you are, and many of you I know are, but some of you, some of you may not be. And you might kind of be thinking, you know, so what about all this stuff? I think it shows, what I've done today I think shows a couple of things. I think it shows that Gettysburg has a very rich history and military heritage that goes well beyond three days in July of 1863. Uh, if you're a Civil War enthusiast, next time you walk Pickett's Charge, hopefully with me or with Eric or one of my friends, um, if you walk Pickett's Charge, maybe next time you do it, pause for a minute to think about some of the, some of the other episodes and adventures um, that, I, that I've talked to you today. Um, but if you're not a Civil War enthusiast, then I would encourage you to, to revisit, to visit this part of the field and, and, and appreciate that you know, the World Wars one and two did play, the Pickett's Charge battlefield did play a part, even if it was a small part, not only in the war efforts, but the development of a Dwight Eisenhower. And one thing I've really come to appreciate in recent years, Gettysburg does not love Dwight Eisenhower enough. He might have in the 50s and the 60s, but in the early 21st century, he is way too much of an afterthought here. Much, much, he, he deserves to be remembered more. We had not only one of the great heroes of World War II, but a sitting, a sitting president living here. So go out and take that visit to the Eisenhower farm. Um, and that's another thing too, I want, I want kind of people to remember Eisenhower. And I'm gonna end with, what, with a quote of his that I like. And I think symbolizes this. Eisenhower said, quote, I plead only for the realization that the handful of heroes on a field such as Gettysburg, symbolize the courage, daring, or high-spirited initiative of a multitude of men. And we should try to learn more of the sort of men that this multitude were. We should try to learn from them, and we should try not to forget them, whether it's a civil war or all the way through World War II. So thank you very much. Thank you.